Hi, uh, I'm Josh Herman. Welcome to Stan Winston School of Character Arts. I am doing a preview for my ZBrush Character Sculpting webinar. Uh, this is the second one of two. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Uh, today I'm just going to be doing a little bit of a demo today on you know, how I'm going to sculpt, what I'll be doing in the, in the demo, but not exactly. Um, just on some personal work, on some other stuff, and then a little bit of an intro about myself as well. Um, so this is a character that you see on screen that is actually uh, from Dan Levisi's uh, LMS Last Man Standing um, you know, series, his kill book of a bounty hunter, um, I don't know what you call it, but this is a character that I was going to sculpt for you guys today, um, just so we can kind of show a little bit of my workflow about how I would go about sculpting a character bust. And I thought that this guy would be a good you know, choice because for the actual course, I will be going over sculpting one of Dan Levisi's Venom designs, uh, specifically the one that he did last, um, or as his workshop for Stan Winston as well. So today we'll work on this for a bit. But first I'll give you guys a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little bit of information about myself. Uh, my name is Josh Herman. Uh, I'm gonna quickly just pull up something, sorry, should have had this up. That's not how you spell it. I'm just gonna go to my CG hub right here so you guys can see some of my work if, in case you guys don't know it or haven't seen it. So. this button, make a little slideshow. Uh, so recently, within the past few months, I was co a contributor of one of eight artists in uh, a new book by Ballistic called uh, Creatures, Essence Creatures, which is where there's eight artists and we all just kind of go over you know, the process of sculpting creatures. Um, so here you can see some of my process below. Uh, starting out with a really rough sculpt and then the transition of going to a full-on, you know, creature, and then um, in the book I explain how I kind of pose and do composition and do all that stuff. So uh, I'm really excited. The book starts shipping sometime this month. So if you guys wanted to pick it up for Christmas, that'd be nice. Uh, if not, no worries. But next, so uh, I got a chance to do Iron Man for Iron Man Three, um, and just to jump back a little bit about myself for my career, I graduated from Noman in 2009 in December 2009 and right after that I ended up uh, working at Legacy Effects which is now our former Stan Winston Studios and I started working there on Real Steel and Cowboys and Aliens and a few other things and eventually I got the chance to work on Avengers so I'll actually just jump to that work real quick for you guys got the chance to work on Avengers and I got the chance to do the Iron Man Mark 7, which is the, if in case you don't know, it's the one where Tony gets thrown out the window and all the pieces, the, the, you know, the new suit kind of falls onto him and uh, he gets saved and that's, it's, it's kind of his final suit. And he also wears it, I think, at the beginning of Iron Man 3 as well. Uh, but I got the chance to do that there, which was a really cool experience. Uh, and I also got the chance while I was working there to work on the Hulk maquette. So, you know, for Hulk, what we did uh, was I worked with Ryan Minerding and Charlie Wynn, and they did a, some sculpting on this uh, before I had gotten it. But they had one had been working on the head and one had been working on the body, and so we kind of combined it and then finished it all together. Um, but uh, we, we did a maquette. They did some illustrations, but we figured since he's going to be a full CG character, to really just kind of finalize the form in a sculpture because it's. It's something we can actually hand off to visual effects later. It's a, you know, it's a usable asset. We can print it out and turn it into a statue, uh, which is what we did. And we put that on set so the, you know, the visual effects artist could have it as a lighting reference. And then we also, you know, eventually it got turned into a collectible. So you can buy that through Sideshow right now, um, which is pretty cool. And then what we also did with the Iron Man on Avengers was that got 3D printed and turned into a a statue, which is what this is. This is actually a photograph. It's not the render, 
and this is statue is about three feet tall, which coincidentally, as of the last week, Sideshow has also announced that this is going to be a collectible. So, a three foot tall Iron Man statue. Uh, if anybody wants to get me one for Christmas, that would be great. Because uh, they're really expensive, but they're really, really cool. Um, so after I got to do all that the stuff at uh, Legacy for the Avengers, I ended up being able to work on um, Total Recall, which is my last show when I was working there. So this is a little bit of design stuff, so trying out some initial things early with possibilities of what the head could be. Maybe it was like a screen inside of a, a case. Uh, so they were very inhuman at all. Um, and then the final design ended up being this. And we turned these into um, suits that the stunt actors or performers would wear. And anything that was inside of these white shells uh, was a green screen or, you know, it was a, a black or gray, uh, you know, legging, basically nylon that with the pistons and insides printed in on the inside of it. And then the waist was kind of digitally shrinked so that it didn't feel too, too human. Um, so this was, you know, my last thing that I got to work on there. What I decided, I ended up leaving Legacy because I really wanted to try working in games. So I worked on Uncharted 3, uh, which is by Naughty Dog, a PlayStation 3 game, in case you guys haven't heard of it. And I got to do a bunch of the background and NPC characters, but I also got to work on one uh, story character. They call them FMA characters, which basically means they're in a movie, they're in a cutscene. Uh, and this is Salim, so this is the character that I did for that. And after, afterwards, I, I ended up getting a call from Marvel, and they said, like, hey, we liked working with you. We need to make 40 Iron Man suits. Would you like to come? So I said, sure. And I got to work on Iron Man 3, and I worked on this. Uh, this is the Mark 42. And uh, there's a front and a back and a side. But I got also got to work on this guy as well as uh, War Machine, which is right here. War Machine ended up getting repainted into Iron Patriot, which is the red, white, and blue version of this. And then I also got to work on about five of the other background suits. Um, I don't remember all of their names, but if I saw screenshots of the movie, I could tell you what they were. Oh, hello. Sure. So there's some more shots of that. Close-up shot. And then back to Total Recall stuff. So when I'm not doing um, the Marvel stuff, I like to do a lot of creatures. I like to do a lot of busts. Um, I do or have taught at you know, creature and concepting classes at Concept Design Academy. Um, so it's something like this. And for the, for the course, for the Stan Winston course, we'll actually be going over how to do a Venom bust. So, uh, you know, the character Venom from Spider-Man, obviously. Uh, let me try to get to my desktop real quick, because I think I had some drawings. open just these ones. Sorry for the inconvenience. So these are all drawings by Dan Levisi who did a course before uh, of Venom or Carnage. I think these ones are Venom as well. Um, but the one that I will be doing is this one which is the one that he drew. Uh, and painted for the course. So what we'll be going over is, you know, sculpt, sculpting really from scratch, following the reference, and then I'll probably incorporate some of these other things as well, just because they're all the same character and they're all drawn by the same artist. But for the most part, we'll be following just this. Um, so yeah, it, I think it'll be a really fun course. I love sculpting busts. I love Venom. is probably one of my favorite characters. So I think it'll be really exciting. I hope you guys join us. So let's just jump back into ZBrush and let's go ahead and just start sculpting away for a little bit. Um, again, this character is Abaddon. Sure. 
Yep. In case you guys hear anything in the background, by the way, we are in a working studio, so don't be alarmed. All right, so now we're back here, I think. I'm uh, just gonna work on this for a little while. Last week, uh, if you guys were not here, I'll show you what I worked on. Uh, these are two characters that I'm working on for a personal piece, which I did work on a little bit more, so hopefully you guys can see the change. Um, but last time I detailed this face of this, you know, this gorilla character for a while, and then I, I went home and I kinda you know, did my changes to it and pushed it a little bit further. Um, and then I've also been working on this lizard character. It's a little dark. Uh, but both of these characters are for some fan art that I'm doing, you know, for some fun reimagining of the game Rampage. Um, but they're, you know, a lot more creaturey, so I like to, to kind of bounce back and forth sometimes when I'm working between something that's more creaturey, you know, maybe just more animalistic, and then a, you know, a suit or a you know, costume type of thing, so. Today, we're going to work on this for a little bit. And the things I want to kind of focus on right now is more of just his profile. Um, I don't have any subdivision levels on it. This is a Dynamesh object. I'm going to hide these little things because they're getting in the way. Everything here is mostly separate objects. So I'm just going to add in some of these little lines here. And all I'm doing is, it, like, these aren't really important for the final sculpt. They're more just sketch lines for myself so that I can see, like, you know, maybe it would be cool if something like this happened, you know. Uh, it's an easy way to just essentially draw on the surface of this. Before I had this as like a really linear line, but I think it kind of killed some of the flow of it. And I'm really just using the Damien Standard Brush right here and the H Polish. Sometimes I'll use the clay, uh, but for the most part, I just use um, about six brushes, seven brushes maximum. Now inside this I do have another face that I've sculpted. So I can kind of approximate, I did trim off his ears and his nose, but I can kind of approximate where his ears are gonna be. Um, yes. That's the plan, yeah. The plan is to make a completely finished you know, it's just a bust, so it's essentially what you'll see here. Um, you know, about shoulders, 
wherever you know this box is, from just the, the top of the shoulders to the neck to the head. But the plan is to make a finished model. Now it's just gonna be, uh, the model is actually gonna be for 3D print. Uh, the plan is to get it uh, rapid prototyped and printed out and painted and you know, finished and looking like a, a statue that could sit next to you. So uh, we're not gonna go over you know the, the more production heavy things as far as uh, retopology or textures or UVs or any of those things but mostly just you know making a really cool and dynamic piece of art All right. it's kind of getting close enough for me maybe there's a little back piece that kind of clips on From working practically for a long time, where all of my uh, all of my digital sculpts when I was working at Legacy would would have to get printed out uh, to be worn either on set or to be worn, you know, as a, a costume or a maquette, or you know, they would always have to go into the physical world, which is a really unique uh, opportunity. And one thing that's kind of taught me is whenever you're building or sculpting, you know, a character, uh, to have kind of a, a practical sense about you. So if this helmet was all one piece, he would never be able to fit it on his head. So finding lines that you can add into it that can allow you to kind of break it up. So if this was a real actor, if we ever wanted to turn this into a, a costume, we could. Um, 3D printing varies. Obviously, it's going to depend on the size of what you're printing. Um, I don't. It's been a, a little while since I've actually done something for printing since I worked at Legacy, um, and there they didn't really always tell us the costs. But the estimate that I've always heard, and I don't know if this is still true, is you know about uh, seventy-five to a hundred dollars an inch. So if you're making it an eight inch statue. It's gonna be eight inches you know, of resin and support material and all that stuff. And it co could cost you, you know, around five to eight hundred dollars. This thing is looking weird. I'm gonna mask this off and I'm gonna try something different with it. shapes how they're just going into the, the helmet kind of loosely. So I'm going to angle them a little bit more. I don't want it to feel like he has a giant ear pad either. Uh, I don't know actually when you're starting out I think it, it varies um, and it, it, it really does depend I mean I, I've heard of people getting paid as little as $12 an hour and I've heard of people getting paid you know 100 times that 10 times that so and not 100 that's an exaggeration um, but it really depends on your skill level, what you know, where you, where you're looking. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a real answer for that. No, I will not. Uh, at least I didn't plan on it. For the most part, fortunately, this is going to be mostly one piece. Um, so, I mean, I can't. That might be a, an after the fact thing. I, I actually don't entirely know. I can do it. But fortunately, since it's all one piece, 
it could just be printed as large one large piece so we don't have to do it as uh, you know the head you know, going onto the shoulders and the you know the knives sticking in and all these little extra pieces the only thing we might have to worry about is the tongue um, but if I do it won't it won't be a big focus of the course all right, I got enough detail in this thing already so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, add some subdivisions here just one I like to work slowly um, not speed wise and I try to work as quickly and efficiently as I can but I'm gonna when I go up my subdivision levels I like to go up slowly and that's because I've found that if I go up too high my models tend to be a little bit blobby um, and if I stay low it allows me to focus on form which is one thing I'll definitely be going over in the course is you know form and planes and and what I'm looking for when I'm sculpting is you know, uh, what's what's making a sculpture look good and what's making parts look bad Popping this edge where there's this kind of paint a layer of something that's kind of put on top. I'm not going to detail the front now. It's kind of just sketched in. It's not too important to really see what that looks like, but I am going to bring out my pinch brush. And for some of these little creases here, you can see how that really kind of brings those edges together. Gonna run that along those edges, holding down Alt for that part, and then here I'm just gonna run it normally. Alt will, will create a valley, and not holding Alt will create like a hill, a peak. So I want to create this nice, you know, obvious plane change from a. From a distance, you'll be able to, to read that you know, there's a, a nice little step there. And I'm going to come in with my Damien Standard Brush. Maybe go back to my Pinch Brush just to hit this real quick. To kind of separate all this. Sometimes if I have a big sketched line that I like, but I want to, I don't want to you know, erase it all and then re-sculpt it tinier. Is I'll just run the pinch brush along all this as well, and that will uh, you know, kind of tighten it up for me. I think I mostly want to get into this mask though. Turn on solo mode, which is where I'm just isolating this object. And then, so I can kind of sculpt the insides of this without the, the edges really bothering me from the other sub tools. to my standard brush. I'm going to change my alpha. Mm -hmm. Roberto is wondering why you're using a tablet and not a Cintiq. Okay. Uh, I actually used to own a Cintiq. It just the, the physical, like how much you have to move your arm to get your, you know, say, I had the 24 HD, which is a you know it's a 24 inch screen, and it's a pretty nice. It's it's a great tablet. It's a great thing, but I noticed that from how far you have to move your hand, like if you want to go from here all the way over to here, there's just a lot of motion, and 
when I'm sculpting around, like I'm, I'm moving around a lot, I'm doing this, you know, and I'll be doing big strokes and um, I just don't really need it. So I've, you know, I've, I've worked with them, I've worked without them. I think that they're great for, for any, you know, uh, illustration stuff, for any digital painting, for any drawing, any storyboarding, any sketching. I think they're fantastic tools for that. Uh, I even like them for whenever I do textures for a model, I like using a Cintiq for that. Because then it's more of just the tangible hand on you know, medium feel. But to me, a Cintiq, you know, whereas when you're drawing with uh, Cintiq on, in Photoshop or Paint or whatever you're doing, it feels a lot like, like you're just sketching on a, a notepad or whatever. But when you're drawing with this, or you know, using a Cintiq in a sculpting program, it doesn't feel like you're sculpting. It still doesn't feel the same way of your hands with clay. So it doesn't, it just doesn't have as much of a benefit to me. I'm gonna try to maybe up this one more time. I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna go back to that pinch brush. Try to get like a nice little crease along this edge. So we can see, so it's not like a rolled edge as it comes into that. And we can see where the, the mask really starts and where the, the flesh of the, the face really starts. The, there is no hotkey for solo mode. What I've done is I've made a hotkey for that. Uh, it's really easy to make hotkeys in ZBrush. Well, all you gotta do is, uh, I'll just make one for you real quick. Um, for, well first off, if you're looking at hotkeys anywhere, if you hover over any of the buttons that you're looking for, you'll see that right next to this it says Shift F is the hotkey for polyframe. For transparency, it's Alt W, and for solo mode, it's Alt S. And by default, I don't think transparency or solo mode have them. What you gotta do is you just hold down Control and Alt, and you tap, and now you'll see in the top left of my screen, there's some white text. And it's telling me to just to push the button that I want for my hotkey. So at that point, I could just hit whatever, whatever hotkey I want, and it will save it. I'm a big hotkey fan. Uh, I think that's because when I first started doing 3D, uh, I worked in 3DS Max, which is, uh, it has a lot of hotkeys. Uh, now I work almost exclusively in Maya, whenever I'm modeling or, or doing you know, any production work. And uh, they don't have a lot of hotkeys, they use a lot of marking menus and other stuff, but I've, I've set everything up so I have hotkeys. Uh, the other thing that I, I uh, kind of pay tribute to it is, uh, I play a lot of video games and you know you're dealing on the keyboard all the time or you're on a controller and you gotta you know you gotta know what all those buttons are quickly and so for example for my brushes if you ever played like first person shooters in a game you know you have your guns and your weapons and all that one through six so I have one is my move brush and two is my clay and three and, and so on one two three four five six are all of my my six main brushes that I use and that cuts down on me having to go up here or, or put them over on the shelf or you know, go through this B menu, which will give you, you know, just there's so many brushes. Like I don't need to be navigating through brushes all the time. So I recommend using hotkeys, getting used, you know, setting a set, trying them for a while, trying to get used to them. Because uh, in the end, it can save you a lot of time. I mean, if it takes me like one, one and a half seconds to do that, and I change brushes, you know, several times an hour, that's you know, minutes turn into seconds, and flip that seconds turn into minutes, and minutes turn into hours, and all of a sudden you've wasted an hour a day just looking for the brush you want. I'm just trying to pop this out a little bit more and show the difference between these two uh, parts of the parts of the sculpt. 
And at this point, it's feeling a little bit difficult to get that, just because there's, you know, something's writing on top of the other. So to force it, I'm going to mask this area off, just holding down control. And then I'm going to choose the move brush. I'm just going to pull it over. And there's a little bit of an overlap there, but that's not a huge deal. I'll smooth it out a little bit. And now we can kind of see that this plane goes clearly underneath that plane. If I want to exaggerate a little more, I can keep that mask and I can pull this up and in. It's going to create a little bit of a recess, but again, we can just kind of smooth that out. And when things get really thin like this, I'll go along the edge and I'll just inflate them. So now that's kind of hiding inside of there. Maybe go ahead and do that quickly for this as well. So I'm just going to pull up. I don't need to pull down because I, I like this shape that's already created. All right, we'll just go ahead and sketch in a little bit more of how this is going to look. Um, I, I use my connections with friends, There's, I have that, uh, but the ones that I've seen and have, have, have friends who have used and they've gotten good um, reviews with were, uh, it's one, what is it called, it starts with an O, I can't remember the title though. Offset? No, it's not offset. I don't remember who it is, but they do a lot of, they'll do printing and they'll do painting and molding and uh, they'll do a lot of stuff for you. So if you're, if you're like me and you're a 3D artist who doesn't really know a lot of, you, you don't know how to make a mold, you don't know how to do that, they can do it for you, which is nice. Obviously you have to pay for it, but uh, they can at least do it for you. Ownage, that's what it was, Ownage. Ownage is the company. Turning on my lazy mouse settings here. Lazy mouse is like a, the easiest way to think of it is like a string. Like it makes you, lets you make easier, like smoother strokes. But this setting up here, I've, I've taken this and customized my interface a little bit. If this is at zero or one, it, it's fine and it works the, a similar way, but You'll notice when I turn this up, there's like a little bit of a string at the end, like a red line for my stroke. And my stroke doesn't, even though I'm moving my cursor, my stroke doesn't happen until the, this red string has become taut because, you know, it's tight. And then it'll, then it'll make my stroke. And what this does is it lets you have a really shaky hand, but you can still make a pretty, a pretty nice line. So I use this a lot when it comes to, uh, detailing or if I'm working on things that are supposed to be a bit more fluid and flowing like mechs or suits or anything hard surface I tend to use this a lot I'm just going to try to punch that in just a little bit I think the biggest mistake that I see most people run into is going into detail way too early. Uh, I see a lot of sculpts out there that are really nicely detailed, but the underlying form just isn't there. Like they just never either spent the time or they were in a rush or they don't, they can't grasp that part of it. Um, and it just doesn't match it, just doesn't fit it. Um, 
So you gotta really focus on your form. Like your underlying shapes are are really, really important to what uh you know what what you're trying to sell. I'm trying to figure out how to make this a graphic shape without making it a pure hole. I guess it could be a hole. I'm just gonna carve this straight in until I see the mesh underneath it. I'm not worried about it being too ugly. I could always go back in and fix it if I needed to. Maybe shape it a little bit more. kind of looking at this thing as more of a graphic a graphic mask I might tone down that eyebrow a little bit because it's getting a little crow magnum in there Sometimes when you're making a stroke, uh, if you have lazy mouse on and your settings are too low, it'll make these little dots. So I'll adjust, adjust that so it's a little lower and it'll turn into one long, nice flowing stroke. up my radius. Radius is that length of that red line that we saw. This will make it so even if my hand's a little shaky in here, I can uh, still have a really nice smooth line. That is the number one tool I wish Photoshop had. Because I would love to be able to just make a nice smooth line in one solid sweep. But you can't always get there. So just adjusting the angles of this a little bit. I'm trying to create you know, a little bit more of a smaller hole here. Sharpen up some of the angles so it's not so kind of tight. Not so loose feeling. Really what I showed you guys at the beginning of this is more just like a rough sketch, you know, maybe take an hour to a few hours to just kind of block something out to get the, the scope of the entire character. It's like red, red hood or red skull. trying to push the depth between these two pieces right now. And then I'll get into the eyebrows and stuff more soon. Maybe go a little bit more on the eyes. These bottom lids are feeling like they're kind of squinted. It'd be nice to have a little bit more shape in them. So I'm just using the move brush. I used to have a preference where I would almost exclusively only work with base meshes. And I still do uh, a lot of the time. You know, 
but for the most part, uh, now I'm pretty comfortable sculpting in just pure Dynamesh or uh, the onset of kind of Dynamesh really did take away a lot of the, you know, I wouldn't say usefulness, but the the thunder of Z-Spheres. Z-Spheres was like a really cool way, easy way to make um, you know, to make easy, easy base meshes. And now it's it's not really. So, I mean, it's still cool, but it, when you have Dynamesh right there, you can always use them in conjunction. Um, I'll typically use a base mesh for something if I know it's going to be humanoid, you know, humanoid shaped. Uh, two arms, two legs, five fingers, five toes kind of thing. But I won't. Uh, it's not a big deal for me if I can't anymore. I think I actually just made him look a little sadder. So I'll undo that. Normally when I'm doing this, I have a second monitor up with some reference. So I would pull up the reference and I'd be looking at it. Um, today I only have the one. My, uh, my monitor at home, I actually have a, a big 30 inch and it ended up breaking. So I'm, uh, just using a small 24. When I'm using a 30 inch, sometimes I'll just put, I won't full screen ZBrush, I'll work with it in like a smaller window or something. I'm gonna turn off symmetry here. Turn it off and on occasionally, but I'm gonna kind of just try to block out some rough eye bag wrinkles here. The main thing I'm trying to get is, you know, you see the wrinkles coming from one direction, and then you see them going the other direction, it's kind of creating a little bit of a cross hatching pattern. smooth it a little bit and I'll do another little pass and then I'll go in just with my standard brush and I'll pop some of these turn down my intensity a lot Turn off Lazy Mouse. I think it's the same things you're concerned about when you do traditional sculpting. Um, you know, form, planes of, a, of an object. Trying to get it to look like what you want it to look like. You know, it's not a. Uh, anatomy, proportion. Like all that stuff is equally as important as it is in, in digital as it is in, in traditional.
I will cover some poly paint, uh, especially with characters like Venom, um, because he's form-wise he's relatively smooth. I don't know if I have any of that up still, but uh, form-wise he's relatively smooth, right? So the main distinction, like in his eyes to the rest of his head, is is just the the color. So it's going to be important to be able to judge the proportions of his of his face just in general, what he's looking like. Uh, poly paint's actually going to be a big part of that. Sometimes when you're sculpting, that's that's not at all important, um, but it can for specific characters be extremely important. I mean, color is usually going to be important at some point. But, uh, not always. I'm just shrinking the size of his head here so he doesn't get too big of a cranium. Sometimes when you're sculpting along, you keep adding and you keep adding and you keep adding and then all of a sudden it, it looks a little strange from an angle or two. Now I need to figure out what I'm doing with this transition. And this is what I mean when it's like lack of form. Like, this area all in here is kind of formless. You can see what's going on most of in here. Um, but when you get to like this area, like there's a soft plane here, but then it kind of just dies out and doesn't really do anything. So I want to define that. And I'm just going to smooth one side, use my smooth brush at a lower resolution. Here, maybe you know, even this whole thing right here is kind of formless, planeless. So I'm going to add some peaks to this. Yeah, you definitely need a you need a tablet. I mean, I can try to sculpt something with you with a mouse real quick. I'll just explain to you why. Like, the pressure sensitivity you get, like if I go back up to 25, like it's always going to be like this. And like the actual control you have, is, it's like drawing with a big bar of soap. Like, go take a bar of soap and draw something, and you're going to see how difficult it is. Um, and then draw something with a pen. So that and the pressure sensitivity alone are like, they're, they're pretty much necessary. You don't need the best one in the world. You don't need a $400 one. You don't need a, you can go get a $50 graphite or bamboo or something like that. But just the control you're gonna get from that is gonna be so much different. So I'm masking off the front of this because I want to add a little bit of a temple here. So I'm going to blur this mask and I'm just going to push all this in. And just to make sure that looks okay, I'm going to hit Control H, which will hide my mask. So I can kind of push this in and we can play with the, uh, the planes there. I want to get a more interesting plane where maybe we can see it coming in. And the back of his head is looking a little weird from some of these angles. We can get a more interesting silhouette. I'm really only using, I mean, I don't plan on this thing to be worn as a costume, so the only reason I'm using that face is more of a guideline. Um, just almost think of it like the skull of this helmet. It's the it's the foundation, it's the structure, it's you know, it's what everything's riding on top of. Now for design sake and I can I can adjust it. But I don't want to push it too far, otherwise it's gonna feel broken.
and just kind of a subtle plane that goes all the way back. I'm using H polish here to kind of inflate some of this and, and push some of it back as well. And sometimes just move. Like if something feels like it's gotten swollen up too much and needs to be pushed back onto his head a little bit, I'll just push it. Still, I'm pretty unsure about how the ears are going to look here. But they're a pretty prominent feature. I mean, obviously the front's the most important, but the ears would help me quite a bit with kind of how this transition is going to look. Making the head look more normal. I don't, I don't love that shape at all. Push some of this in. I'm just using the move brush, trying to find a shape that's kind of interesting. Trying to complement some of the other lines in there. Yes. I actually use those brushes a lot when I'm doing creature stuff. Um, when I'm doing more hard surface stuff, more costumey, well, not even in costume stuff, it's not a big deal. I don't, I use it a lot there as well. Um, so, like, if I jump over to just one of these real quick, like in this, I, if I go back and I use clay buildup, which is similar to clay tubes. Clay tubes, just the longer I hold down the stroke, it doesn't add anything. Clay build up, the longer I hold down the stroke, the bigger the stroke gets. You can see, especially in the profile, it's a lot bigger. So here I can go over with clay tubes a lot. It's gonna immediately add some of this wrinkle, some of this texture, and a lot of life to this character without really having to, to do anything to it, which is perfect. That's exactly what I want. And even at a low subdivision level, if I'm not, you know, if I'm, I'm blocking something out from scratch, it tends to work really well for that as well. Um, like if I was going to start blocking out on this guy some you know, some muscles or whatever, as I kind of go up, I can go up subdivision levels. I can go this way as well. I can smooth that out, and it makes really nice forms. It's really easy brush to create form with. Um, so I, I, I like it. I use it a lot. It's just it's a case by case basis as far as what I'm actually going to use it on. But there's no downsides to it. It's all personal preference. I've seen some guys that really only exclusively will use one brush. Uh, maybe two, three brushes max. Uh, I've seen some guys that'll use you know, all the brushes. They'll find a use for all of them. Um, but again, it's all personal preference. I usually use about eight maximum. One, two, three, four, five, six, which I showed you guys, and an H polish, which I will bring in as a specialty if I need it for something. And then the other one is probably uh, Trim Dynamic. So for this I've also created a, a neck piece, which apparently has some floating thing there. So I'll just delete that real quick. Modify topology, delete hidden. That's now gone. But this neck piece is kind of so I can start to block in some of these details. So I've already created a little bit of a sketch line for maybe there's some sort of a, an inner collar. So we're just going to start adding to that. 
And we can use clay build up for this. And then maybe we'll just block out some big wrinkles real quick. And we'll do them in symmetry just for time's sake. Typically if I'm doing wrinkles or anything like that, I will wait more towards the end. And that is just because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have this weird Rorschach effect where you look at it and it just kind of feels odd. You can't really, you, if you know what you're looking for, you'll know why, but it's like, it's because if we go into the front, you'll see like this perfect mirroring. Normally, I can I can do that on the sides and it might look okay, but if I get to the front, I'll, I'll turn off symmetry and do some of the big strokes of this across. Maybe even turn on Lazy Mouse. I think the key to that is really you just need to be rotating around a lot. Uh, if you notice when I'm sculpting, um, I'm rotating around a lot. Like I don't, I don't focus on one area too long. So I'm all going around the back. I'm, you know, like on the helmet, I started in the back and then I was at the front and I went to the ears. And, and when I'm at those areas, I'm not, I'm not tunnel visioned in on one specific area. Uh, I'm kind of working. I mean, the phrase is that you're working it in the round. And that just means you're looking at it from all angles. And when you're doing that, you want to make sure that everything is looking fine. You don't want it to, like you're saying, you don't want to work on one area for an hour and then turn to the side and have it just be, you know, strange looking or flat or, you know. One thing, I mean, there's a, as far as for the eyes and that specific area of the body, um, you want to focus on draft. And what I mean by draft is, after I smooth this out real quick, I'll show you. So I blocked out all those wrinkles and I just quickly go over them and I smooth them. If I want to enhance them, I can, but I just want to get a little bit of something in there. So I can put all that other stuff back, except for these. And it'll have a little bit of you know, detail now in this area as well. Let's just go, they have some default tools in here. With some default faces. Um, we'll use the, the demo face. And what we'll do is, from a profile, sometimes what'll happen is, is you'll be sculpting and it'll, it'll maybe look like this. And the eyes will just, uh, mask off these and we'll just pull them forward so they kind of fit those eye sockets ish and you can sculpt from the front view and it's going to look okay for a long time but what happens is as you see is from a profile view you can start to see how just flat it is and you can see how in a three-quarter view um, just how you can really just see the flatness of this and what we want to see from a front view is um, or excuse me from a top view is more draft. And what that is, is, we'll turn this way, more of an angle backwards, especially in faces. Like you'll be surprised at how much angle there is in one. So I wanna take this, you can do it from a top view, you can do it from a side view, and just pull all this back. And then maybe adjust the eyes to fit. I'm just gonna bring them back to where they were, which is pretty much right where they were. But now from the top view, we have a much more angular front. 
so we want to have a lot more draft on it. And that's going to be part of what makes your faces look less and less flat. So pretty close back to where the original was, actually. So on this thing, let's see if I'm following my own advice. There's some draft. I could probably pull this back a little further. Which helps, you can see already. That's something I, I would want to maybe pay more attention to. And what I'm going to do to make sure that every, all the other sub-tools follow suit, so I'm going to first make sure that symmetry is on them all. And I'm going to go over here. I'm going to pull it back. Then I'm gonna go to my next sub tool without touching anything. I'm gonna stroke, modifier, replay last. Oh, and it didn't do it for me. I guess I touched something. What that does, what stroke replay last does, which I've set a hotkey for seven, is uh, you can make one line, and if you hit replay last, it will redo that stroke for you. Now that'll also work for other subtools, so if I pull this back, I can go to my other subtool and hit seven, and uh, pull everything else back. So they'll all have a little bit more draft on them now. Which helps a lot. You can see even in here. I do want to trim down those ears, because from the profile, from the front view, they're kind of looking a little silly. Gonna kind of maybe make it a nice little angle on it. Post processing, like in Photoshop, or what? Hello, how are you, brother? Good, good. good how are good. you doing? We have a surprise guest. <laughs> like, welcome. How are you doing? Good. Dan will be here for Excellent. Oh, Dan's coming. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. This is Stefan. Uh, I don't know if you're on camera, but welcome. I think we're sharing my screen right now. Should oh, I, I, should I un... Ah, <laughs> sorry. That's all right. Uh, Dan Levisi is actually going to come by in, a, in just a little bit, and we're going to we're going to chat and talk and you know a little surprise thing for you guys. So since I'll be doing his you know, a, a version of his Venom, it'll be cool to be able to kind of talk through it and just hang out and you know two people working on the same thing, sort of, at the same time, so, should be fun. Okay. The future of CG. Yeah, do you think it's gonna replace prop builders and actors and all of that? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think any of that will happen. Uh, I think part of that is, um, it's just a lot, that's, a, that's a lot to replace. That's a lot. I mean, that would take millennia, centuries to, to make go away. Um, I think people are starting to get over CG in a way. Well, CG is also being you know, subsidized and outsourced and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to other places, which isn't, uh, which is helping it become cheaper. But it's you know it's becoming a more of a just an everyday job. I think what's really going to happen is you're just going to see it in more typical every day-to-day -day things. I don't think it's going to take over everything. I think you're going to see it in more advertising for no, no mom and pop shops could do it. You know, other things like that. Like I don't see why uh, it has to be a, such a big budget thing because it's going to get cheaper and it's going to get more accessible and. The students who are learning it now are gonna, you know, have their entire lives will be dedicated, or some of them will be dedicated to learning that. And uh, you know, whereas myself, I only learned it once I was in college. So they're gonna be a million times better than I am. And they're gonna be faster than I am, probably, and they're gonna be cheaper than I am. So, which is a scary thought to think about, but it. Uh, could be the truth. But I don't think it will replace actors, never. You're never gonna get that performance that you get out of an actor, you're never gonna get that, uh, 
the life from everything. I mean, even with mocap, like the amount of work that they have to do to clean up mocap, and that'll probably get better as well. But it's not gonna, it's never gonna replace it, in my opinion. Prop builders and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's you've seen what happened to the Star Wars prequels when they had nothing to act off of, right? You saw that they were, you know, a lot of the scenes were emotionless and didn't really, really work very well, and and that's because they didn't know what was happening. You, know, I mean, you can still shoot stuff CG with green screen and all that, but having something there is a huge, huge benefit. There's nothing cheaper than shooting something in camera. And I don't mean that in a big budget way. I mean, like, like say you're a beginning filmmaker, right? With, with the advent, obviously, of YouTube being huge and, and all these other kinds of things that are massive. Like, why, unless the visual effects get really cheap, you're never gonna be able to afford them. So there's always gonna be people shooting things on camera. And they're gonna be young and they're gonna shoot things on camera and then they're gonna get older and if they become professionals, they're gonna to wanna to still shoot things on camera because they're comfortable with that. Just kind of tweaking some of these lines that got maybe a little warped. I introduced this plane here. I don't know what it's doing to be honest, but it's all right. Hey buddy, I'm switch this out for you. Oh, all right. Is my mic dead? Could they not hear me? No, they can hear you. It's just clipping a little bit. Oh, okay. All right. I got a new mic. And you're live. And I'm live. Here we go. Sorry, I guess there was a mic problem. Um. So yeah, I'm just kind of adjusting some of these lines on this. Might go ahead and just solidify what this ear looks like. Step out. Turn on lazy mouse again so you can see that this is just way easier. Way, way, way easier. some of this stuff in, maybe get a little bit more detail in here. Squish this head down a little bit. Pinch the nose in. This is all just now like what I'll do is I'll you know I'll work for a little while and then I'll kind of I'll take an overall look at it and say like what's not working for me. So what I love, I would love, and sometimes I even just go into silhouette. So it's a really dark view, and I'll just hit V to change the colors, and uh, maybe try to get some more in these eyebrows. Maybe like I had already pinched that nose. A nicer plane on this jaw would be nice. Might even introduce a secondary plane here. Just to play complement a little bit to this. And then pop this out. This is more of an anatomical plane than it is anything. But... From a front view profiles, it could add a little bit of depth to it. 
And this isn't in the design, this is all free freestyle in it. But an additional line might not hurt. Uh oh. Uh oh. How's it going? Good man. Good to see you. You're not on camera. Just just working away. Uh Looking great. Thanks, man. Um, get him all mic'd up. Dan is here. Dan is here. Where is the oh. camera? Oh, I do a little intro. I don't know if I'm on. Hey, Hi, yeah, all. Hey, My name go. is uh, Eric Litoff with the Stan Winston School. Yep. Um, Thank you for joining us all. Uh, we're very happy to have Josh here. Josh, is this is a second preview. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to be taking in the class, here comes Dan, Dan Levisi's Venom uh, into 3D. Josh is gonna take the Venom piece that uh, Dan did with, for, with us. We'll actually a little redo on it. Um, and Josh is gonna take it in. So we asked Dan to come in and chat and meet everybody and ask yeah. some questions, yeah. answer some questions from you guys, discuss what's gonna be coming up. And uh, you know, we're so excited. I'm yeah. so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Should be well, fun. Cool. What do you want to do? An intro of yourself? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Which camera am I looking at? This one. All right. Hey, everyone. Dan Levisi, and I'm here with Josh Herman. And, uh, yeah, I guess so. All right. They know. Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> I think you guys know what I do. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm just going to go back to my screen. We'll keep working. I was telling them earlier that this is, you know, one of the guys that is from LMS. If you want to explain about him. Yeah, his name is Abaddon. He's a... Uh, psychopath, assassin, um, very religious-like, and um, he wears this skull mask that Josh is doing a great job on right now. And I mean, that's pretty much it. I don't really know much of his character yet because I just created him and just mm -hmm. wrote a little brief backstory. He'll develop over the years, I'm sure. Sure. But um, yeah, it's looking great so far. Cool. So what are you doing right now? I was just kind of, I started a little bit earlier um, with a little, just tightening it all up a little. Mm -hmm. And uh, introducing some of like the neck stuff. I'm trying to figure out more of the the helmet. Like, how does it fit? Like, is this a like a that's, paint? Uh, well, see, is that's what I was thinking. That maybe it could be either paint or it could be like an actual skull oh, that's like been actual bolted one. into the yeah, helmet. Yeah, would be cool. So it's got memories. like stuff in it or something. Yeah. But then, like, I kind of like the big eyebrows too. So I was like, maybe it's just molded onto yeah. it, and then he painted it like a skull. Sure. He carved it. Yeah. I kind of like the more overexpression of, yeah, of this. Yeah. Exaggerated. Which is cool. Yeah, but I'm digging it so far. Thanks. How long have you been working on it for? Uh, not too long. I worked on it just today for about an hour, and then I had I hadn't worked on it for more than maybe an hour or so before that, just to get the rough block out. Um. For everything so you could have all the pieces I put in just roughly like one thing I like to do is uh, show the whole character so you can you can get like all the pieces in and then I'll like finesse the pieces you yeah know, just this piece is like roughy crappy knives but you know. is this one open for everyone what one is this like show yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 can I get a picture and put it on Facebook yeah sure. yeah of course do you mind doing that straight on shot again? That was really cool. This one? Yeah, with the knives. Oh, sure. I'm going to ask you guys in a second what the address is. Do you want me to get a picture? What? Do you want me to get a picture? If you want. <laughs> Josh, this is Allison, by the way. Hi, Allison. Hi. Detailed pretty much everything else. So I'm going to go ahead and start detailing some of this paint in the front, just so you can really see the definition 
of, uh, I actually had done a little bit of poly paint earlier to show the difference from the back to the front. Turn that up a little bit. Turn that off. I'll repaint the separation in a little bit, but I mostly just want to get this kind of to feel just a little more contrast in it. Even if I use the same lines I've got from my rough sketch, I can still I can still uh, I can still use them. Just pop them. wet versus brush strokes it should look. Is this the first dual artist Stan Winston thing that's happened? Probably. So in this part, I'm not worried about it being too clean. That was a question I had last week was like, when you sculpt with some of these brushes that have a lot of texture in them, should I try to smooth out the texture? Should I try to keep it clean? Should I, you know, what's the right way to do it? And I always would love to try to keep more texture in it, especially if it's something that's handmade. Um, you know, like this is gonna be it's supposed to be hand painted in here. So once I get this kind of set up in here, I'm going to introduce a lot of the texture that's in here all along the rest of it. I'm going to make one go a little higher. Get in there. Sometimes when I'm sculpting this kind of stuff, it's kind of weird. Not that it's specifically dripping, but I like to sculpt upside down uh, because it's it makes you not look at what you're actually looking at. Like I don't recognize this as a face as much. I'm just looking at you know the forms and the shapes. I think it's kind of similar to flipping an image like horizontally. Are there any questions out there? Has any? Feel free to to ask him. Most of the time, it's all hand sculpted. You can't hear me, so. Oh, sorry. The question was, um, do I use noise maker for details, or is it all hand sculpted? And you already know the answer. Uh, it's already it's all hand sculpted most of the time. I will use alphas or something like that. Uh, the thing with noise makers is. 
it's, you can mask it off, of course, but uh, I tend to find that it's really good for one surface, like one subtool. And like for this, for this thing, I'm sculpting it as if it's kind of two materials. Like there's more of this painted and molded and, and this kind of thing up here. And then there's a, you know, Kevlar fiberglass, whatever helmet. So I'm not trying to get too busy with it, but I'll just go ahead and paint some of this stuff in as well, just to kind of like really pop it out there so it looks a little, you can really tell the difference. So I'll just go like this. I'm actually gonna pay attention because I wanna learn some stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna fill this whole thing with a color, just a little bit darker so we can pop it more. And then I'll go back into a white and I'll turn on symmetry just to block out the most of this. And we'll fill out, we'll fill the rest of everything with this as well. Just real quick. I'm gonna go back to here. Cool. Maybe we'll just, before I do that. Whoa. <laughs> destroyed his nose so he could wear it <laughs> without it looking like a beak. That'd actually be cool as a character thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, since there wasn't really too much of a thing on him, I figured maybe he's like, if he's all mutilated, I don't know. Oh yeah, he is. You see it so. in the book. He uh, scar carved a whole skull into his face. No. Oh. So. When he was a kid. There you go. But I like the whole not having a nose thing. It's kind of weird. It's, it's a little creepy. Like if it rotted off. Yeah, exactly. All right, now he's got some eyes. Now I can, uh, paint some of this in. So what are you doing right now? I just want to like really get the distinction between the oh, the, two. the black and the white since it's all one piece right now. Yeah. And I was telling before like this is going to this will be something I'll have to do on Venom because he's formless, yeah. relatively simple. Yeah. But his he, the big thing about him is the color break up from his eyes to his the rest of his body. Uh, and his his Spider-Man pattern on his chest, I guess, and back. But when you're when you're doing this kind of stuff, like the, the color breakup and the proportions of the color is super important. Oh, it might have been off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was on. Okay. Yeah. Can you not hear me? All right. Is it working now? Test, test, test. All right. So all this should be in symmetry, so I don't have to do the other side. But when I get to the teeth, or that little front grill part, um, I'll break that, just because it's not symmetrical anymore. I wish I had this when I was painting. <laughs> Reference. You've been you had started to do some ZBrush yourself, right? Yeah, but not like this. Right, so would any of this be considered like hard surface or? Yeah, this stuff all is like the helmet is is relatively hard surface. Just more of it. Like what I consider that is like hard, def definite. Yeah. Planes. But did you do this all in ZBrush? Yeah. Yeah, this is all ZBrush work. I could always go later, like, like say we wanted to build it into like a practical helmet or something, uh -huh. or if we really just wanted to like to punch the detail up one more notch, I could go into a different package and uh, you know really make it the crisp, and you could set thicknesses on all the, the stuff. But for most of the time, it's pretty good at just uh, getting it ninety percent there. Yeah. And then what I'll do, <clears throat> actually give me a second, I'll, I'll just turn his head. Yeah. Um, what I'll do, like at this point, it's pretty much ready to start working like asymmetrically. So I'll take uh, the rest of the body and I'll, I'll mask off half of it. And this is a little trick I learned from my friend. 
But if in case I want to work, just going to all these other subtools here and turning off symmetry. In case I still want to work in symmetry later, uh, I'm going to turn his body and not his head. So I'll turn his neck one way a little bit. And then I'll go to all these other subtools and uh, start turning them. You got the grimace look. This one. So they'll all start to kind of move one at a time. Don't know which one's which. That one's got symmetry on. So like is it a command that moves the rest of the stuff to what you just did? Yeah, it'll do the exact same stroke that I just did oh, cool. on whatever I'm on. Where's the shoulder pads? There they are. So they should follow in suit. do it that way. Or I guess I could do it the other way. We'll just sculpt it asymmetrically because that's what we'll be doing for the course. Let's go through all this. Undo. I don't know what that is. Right. I like your little scribbled. <laughs> yeah, like, mm -hmm. That's just like, you know, trying to get all of the, the character in there. So it's like, okay, that goes in there and yeah, it's like when you're sketching. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's really just like a sketch. Like, I just want to get the whole guy set up. And Josh, do you want to try to steal your screen from You now? do whatever you got to do. Show people through the course. Sure. Uh, I'd like to apologize to everybody for the uh, audio problems that we had earlier. They seem to have started themselves up. Mm -hmm. Starting to get busy. Yeah. Okay, guys. If you will go to the Stan Winston School and click on this webinars button here, I think we're the two youngest teachers. It will take you to Josh Herman's uh, page. It's well. Let me go ahead and click it. Okay. Okay. Like stop it. Sure. Sure. So it's going to take you to this. Uh, the listing of all of our webinars, you go ahead and click the banner. I'd like to invite you to come and check out this page. I know that most of you signed up through this page, and we'd love to see you in the course. Josh, I'm going to go ahead and hand this back over to you. Sure. All right, so I was going to, I was going to try to do, uh, just turn the body, but there's so many pieces that, to do it right now is just a little bit of an annoyance. So I'm just going to do it this way. Try to turn his head a little bit. Now the inside's not going to go along, so we're just going to have to pretend we know what we're looking at. So I'm going to move it a little bit, and I'm going to go to the other ones, and I'm going to hit that same replay last. Just once, not twice. Maybe go here and turn down the resolution a little bit on some of this, just so it runs a little bit faster. Tilt his head down. Going into the other subtools and hitting the same thing. That way we can get a little bit more acting out of the eyes. Maybe move these out of the way again. Just to get a little bit of something from all this. And Josh, for your renders for uh, uh -huh. the, uh, the class, are you gonna be doing an external render or just straight from ZBrush kind of concept? Or are you even gonna go over rendering? Uh, I might go over it a little bit, but it'll probably, if I do, it'll be just, um, just ZBrush. No external renderers. Um, and I've got, a, I've got a bunch of them here while I was dealing with the audio questions. So sure. Kind of yeah. Them. Rapid. Do them. <laughs> what, what would you suggest to practice uh, sculpt for beginners? Uh, just messing around with ZBrush, creating stuff, or go for concepts? This is from Kevin. Uh, okay. I think the best thing to do when you're starting out is like 
paint, like do whatever you want to begin with till you're comfortable with the, pro if, you're, if you're just learning the program, do whatever you are comfortable with. Like if you want to sculpt a monster, sculpt a monster. If you want to do a creature, do a creature. If you want to do a, a robot, try to do a robot. Um, and that's just while you're learning. But once you've kind of got a grasp of it and you really want to start like finessing your, your craft as, as you would call it, I would try to do studies or I would try to do um, studies or aim for specific concepts. And that way, you know, you've kind of got a, a bar that you have to hit. And that's because if you're going to be working from somebody's art, you know, you're going to have to be making it look like their art. Uh, unfortunately, you don't always get a, especially if you're a sculptor or a modeler or whatever, you don't always get to be doing your own thing. So, you know, it's sometimes you got to work from somebody else's work, and that's a, a really important skill to have. So I would always recommend uh, hitting, you know, trying to sculpt or, or model a specific concept or or something like that. So now it's asymmetrical, I'm just starting to break up some of these uh, textures on it. Just adding a little bit of texture here with the, the clay build-up brush. At this point, I'm not too worried about things feeling symmetrical, feeling like they're the same size form-wise. Like I know this cheekbone's roughly about the same size as that, so. I can go in and add like a little bit more, you know, around the edge, or I can flare something out, and I'm, I'm not really worried about it anymore. Josh, this one, this is really a combination from Billy and Steven. Okay. Um, how do you get a break? Like, uh, recommendations for aspiring artists, like what hurdles to go over, that kind of stuff, to get noticed, just to get your artwork noticed. To get your artwork noticed? Uh, Post it online as much as you can. I mean, you know, the Facebook and CG Hub and DeviantArt and all those, like, that's definitely one way to get noticed. Um, but you gotta, you, know, you gotta do some good stuff to kind of rise to the top of that. Um, when it comes to professionally, you just kind of, you just have to keep pushing. You know, you gotta, any opportunity you get, I would, especially when you're early, early in your career, I would take it. Um, don't get lowballed too much if they're going to pay you at all, because sometimes they don't. Um, but you know, it's the opportunities you get now and the people you're working with now that are early in your career that will, will forward you later. So you're kind of investing in yourself in a way. Yeah, just there's unfortunately there's not a you know a set way to break into the industry. Uh, if you live near conferences, if you live near events, if you live near mixers, any of that stuff is always going to be good to go to. You know, connecting a name and a face with with work that you post online can't hurt. Um, yeah. So I'm just going over this whole thing, adding a little bit of texture. And what that's doing, if I turn off the color, the main goal for me with this is that you can see that there's a slight difference between this and this. Aside from the color. Like the color is a bonus. But I want it to feel like this is something painted on top or it's a, just a different material or it's just not the same. And I'm just going over it really lightly with its, uh, this clay build-up brush. And I'm just thinking of it texturally, like it's maybe it's brush strokes or something if he's painted it. If it's sitting on top, you know, sometimes you see that thick paint. If somebody paints something themselves and it's got like a, 
you know, really thick brush strokes and residue on it, and sometimes the paint's a little thick in an area or something like that. And I'm gonna go over the whole thing. I could have done maybe some of this symmetrically before I uh, posed it, but I kind of like the, the freedom of just going over it now without that. And then I'll go over something with the, the Damien standard brush to kind of add a little bit of these kind of little lines and pock marks and you know, imperfections. There is a posable symmetry option, which I could use if I wanted to, to see if it would work, and it probably would. In most cases, it's pretty solid. Uh, but I kind of enjoy, kind of enjoy this part where you just gotta zen out and relax and just kind of go over the whole model. It's not the best thing to do if you're on a crunch for time, by any means, but uh, One thing that really, like when you're adding these little textures, it like kind of breaks up and helps a lot, is it makes it feel less digital. And I think in the in the end, that's kind of the goal is to make it feel less and less digital. And the reason that is, in case uh, you were wondering, is it's because it doesn't um, it doesn't um, have the the highlight that a CG object does. Like if we look at the highlight of this over here, it's like perfect, you know, perfectly clear. There's nothing in the way, and and that's such a hard thing to find in in natural life. Like, you know, when you're painting or sculpting or whatever, you, you kind of want to add those imperfections, even if they're really subtle, because it's gonna it's gonna sell it and it's gonna make it feel not digital. So even if I go over and smooth this a little bit and make it feel not so much like brush strokes anymore, but it gets that kind of wobble. The form is still underneath there, but there's a nice little wobble under there that'll make it feel a little more natural. It's like a big helmet to fill the head in. Yeah. There we go. There she is. Mm -hmm. How many times have you painted Venom? At least six or seven times. Really? <laughs> yeah. I love painting them. Yeah. That's like my go to whenever I do a workshop or yeah. something. Just fun. Yeah. It's easy. You don't do all the saliva and wet, gross stuff uh, also. Yeah, that's the easy part. That's the fun part. Yeah. The hard part is usually the skin. Is you it? have to fill it in. All right. So tell us a little bit about the project, uh, how it came about. Mm. I was originally asked to do a workshop for the Stan Winston School. And, uh, as usual, like I was just telling him, I uh, whenever I do like a workshop, I usually paint Venom because I think he's a simple design, but he's really fun. You can add a lot of personality to him through his tongue, his eyes, his mouth. So um, I start off with that. Uh, I did a recording for it, and um, thankfully they brought Josh on board to uh, model it. So now we're collaborating on the project, and yeah, I pretty much set up with this. There's more to it, which we'll show at a later date, mm -hmm. and. Um, 
Josh, I guess, yeah, you take it from here. Yeah, I'm going to run with it and try to make it look awesome. And yeah, that's the plan, I guess. It's kind of the you know, handing down the line and then seeing what, what happens from there. I think that's the fun part is when, you know, like, because I, when I work with someone, I don't really, I don't like being controlling. Even with this, I was like, you know, here's the basic concept and mm -hmm. run with it, do it with what you want. So even with Venom, I'm like, just have fun with it. I feel like that's when the best work shows. Sure. Is now when you're like, you got to do it like this, and yeah. like that. Make it has to match this picture yeah, from this identically. angle. Yeah. yeah, that always. Even look at it back at it now, it'd be like fix his upper jaw for me. <laughs> uh, I don't like his teeth now that I'm looking at it. Well, but uh, yeah. Do you have that a lot when you go and look at your old work? Do you always hate it? All the time. Yeah, I do that all the time. There's like, some pieces that I see that like I still really like, like that one. That Comic Con Gabriel cover. The bottom left one with yeah. the bag, the dark horse yeah. bag. But those are the ones where I'm sure you've had this too, where you're like you're working on something, you just know oh, it's yeah. like you're doing it right. Yeah. It's usually like the personal pieces, yeah, yeah. that you like that fall in really love cool. with. And I knew that I had to impress with that one, so I'm like, right. I'm going all out. Yeah. But uh, but then there's some pieces, yeah, where I look back and like I could have fixed that or I could have done that mm -hmm. better. You know, but that's the whole learning experience. Yeah, it's cool. Sometimes I'll have it where I'm working on a piece for so long that I'll start to hate it. And I, I think it looks bad. And then I'll look at it like six months later and be like, I should have finished it. That was actually pretty good. Yeah, good yeah. example is, can you click on the Venom one? The top, top right middle. middle. Yeah. That Venom right there. The Venom is in the right between the on two the Gabriels. right column. Yeah, right column. More from Dan the VCR. Uh, uh, no, up. <laughs> I think it's in between three Gabriels. Yep. <laughs> no, scroll up. You only see half of its face. Yeah, it's right there. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, that one's really cool. Yeah, that one was a full-on venom body, mm -hmm. and he was sitting inside of a throne of symbiote. Oh, that's and it was, cool. It's like all coming to life, and there's all these teeth and jaws everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then in like a pool of symbiote with Spider-Man trying to reach out, and like all the symbiote was choking him. But then I just got to that point. I was like, man, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and I just stopped working. On it. That's yeah. cool, though. But yeah, he's always fun to draw. God forbid they do a movie version. Yeah, a one that uh, actually looks like him. <laughs> no more. What's that? What was that dude? Dover Grace. Dover Grace. Of all people. <laughs> oh, that was a terrible choice. That's like putting me in that movie. Isn't it? That's <laughs> and then a, me as Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible choice. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I think it's going to be really fun, though. I'm excited. I think it'll be cool. I'm very uh, excited. Yeah. It'll be cool to see a full. Like you said, you know. Because you only see one side of it. Sure. So when you get to model the other side, mm -hmm. that's yeah. fine as well. You can see all the angles and like, hopefully. Yeah, like I've never seen the side of that, but I've never seen the back of his helmet. Oh, right. Yeah. Which I haven't either. So yeah. I just kind of made it up and I just. I just have I fun with it. Just do whatever you want. It looks, or hope it looks okay. The thing with him is that like I want it to be like almost like a religious looking suit. Mm -hmm. It's like crosses, but like really cool, like gold like, emblems in the back. Of oh, yeah. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. He's Oop. like that crazy religious dude <laughs> that takes it too far yeah like, uh, <laughs> you like him on your team but you don't yeah. want to hang oh, out no, he's with them he's extremely good when he does but yeah you don't want to hang out with them yeah how are you going to go about making the symbol I don't know yet could you just take the symbol and make an alpha out of it and stamp it on yeah you could do that that's probably what I would do for the text as well yeah or, unless it's supposed to be like a hand scrawled no, no, yeah. text which I guess some of it would be anyway, so maybe at least start with um, with uh, an alpha and then kind of adjust it yeah. from there. Could be the the best way to kind of have it, give it a, like a regular uniform shape and then adjust it. I love it when you, it looks down like he's kind of like, like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's always like my go-to face. Oh yeah. The, I mean, green badass. The downward angle. Yeah. Time to make you insta famous. <laughs> I've already. You don't have an Instagram, right? No, I don't. I should. Just to promote art, that's what I do with it. You should. What's your website? Uh, Droids for sale. But my Facebook is the best. But if on Instagram you can't get to that. Alright, let's just uh what's your Facebook page? Art of Josh Herman. 
so I'm going to thin out the collar a little bit because it's feeling a little thick. Because he's kind of a, you saying more of a religious figure, maybe. And I honestly haven't looked at the concept for a while, so maybe I should look at that in my Google thing. Yeah. In here. I was gonna say yeah, it's on the lips. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So the symbol I would probably do as an alpha. Um. Look at now, like I haven't come, what I'll do is I'll usually work for a while by myself. Even in, pr in production, I'll do this. I'll work for a while by myself and then, um, then I'll compare it. I don't like sit, stick to things like a blueprint a lot of the time because I find that like it's really constricting. So I'll probably make some of this a little bigger. Oh, there you go. Kind of make it feel a little more skull like. See, yeah, originally it was just leather, then I was like, it would be pretty cool if you like bolted someone's skull into the actual helmet, carved out the inside. Mm hmm. There's a little painted, little, little holes in here. Oh, yeah, he's got the little breathing holes. Just kind of sketch them in. One, two, okay. Try the, the symmetry there. Let's see. Posable? No. Not happening. Yeah, see when it does that, can you not go back? Mm -mm. Unfortunately, no. It's kind of just like painting at this point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Once I once I get something in, in asymmetry, I just kind of That's cool. just deal with it. What are you doing right there to, uh, when you're pressing the key? So I'm repeating um, the stroke that I just made. Oh, cool. It's kind of off. But, uh, you can... I wish they had it in Photoshop. Yeah. Like, if you make one line, yeah. like, I can do this, and then I can just hit this and it'll do the same line. I use it for this stuff for, like, circles, and yeah. I can make, like, really quick... Because circles are, like, the hardest shape to sculpt, because you're always... In this, they're not too bad, but... Especially modeling, they suck. What about when you go for like, uh, like would be like indents or same thing? Yeah, same thing. Like when you're like denting up armor. Mm -hmm. Or I'll use um, I'll use like the standard brush, and I'll just change like the tip on it to like something like this, and I'll just kind of go. Yeah, if you were to do like a like a knife dash, I'll go That's over it as a start. That's cool because the other one looks like a bullet hole. And kind of adds like a nice little. It's like dense, you know? yeah. Full like dense. Turn this down. See if I really know how to use ZBrush. I would yeah. spend like hours just doing that. <laughs> just detailing. Like, yeah. Just, yeah. I do that too. I just detail stuff sometimes. Like, like if I don't have a like for my personal stuff. Like I was working on this thing, like this monkey for Rampage. <laughs> and I just like wanted to zen out for a while, so I just like started sculpting the face and just all asymmetrically just like detailing the face yeah, out. See, that's the best. That's like rendering to me. Yeah, exactly. When I spent like four hours or something. Like, yeah, like I just, a little I, gauntlet. I kind of like it. Like I don't, it doesn't matter. Oh, you're the presenter now, Chris. Oh, it's, uh, I'm sorry, your screen was frozen. Oh, all right. No worries. Hello. So, talk out some of these things. Maybe go back to this. Yeah, like these little bars here, I just like threw them in. Like everything's really rough. Like you painted the skull white. Is there any way you can paint the eyes black? Not the actual eyeball, but the skin. This part? Yeah. Yeah, I can make, make that part. Yeah. That's what it looks like. <laughs> there you go. You can go darker. Some of these things, like, if they get too black, they just, like, become absolute black. Yeah, no, you have time. It's like some stuff like that. Okay. That's it. Does he have... He does have two guys. Paint eyeball. Thing. Go 
to his eyes. Let's quickly lock in some of those. Keeps all the color, so it kind of gives it a weird like, look. Ugh. <laughs> he's, really a, he's a little cross-eyed. <laughs> well, this uh, mask. He's really badass. Yeah. He's cross-eyed. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. He's blind. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he's so angry. Fun of CG, like there's so so many dumb things that'll happen. You're like, oh, oh, it's great, and then you rotate you it, move it around, or like, working in games like on Uncharted, like we would test the skinning for the character, which is like where it gets bound to the animation, and it wouldn't always like all of it would go, so like half of the character would be stuck to itself when it's like walking around. Fill those with a different material, maybe. Yeah. And go back here. some poly paint stuff. I usually make a brush that's kind of like a little spattery brush. And I'll just start choosing colors. Your new book is, it's, or not the new book, but it's the reprint of the book, right? Well, it's a reprint, but there's like a lot of There's a lot stuff. of new stuff in it. When is it shipping? When is it coming out? Actually, I just got, I was just on Safan that it's supposed to ship in three days. Excellent. Yeah. That's cool. Now that I've seen this, I wish we got you in there. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. What eyes does he have? Brown. Do you usually paint your models? Yeah, I like to. I try to, if I have time. This is what it actually looks like. This is the magic behind everything. Fill it all with this color first. And then I'll go in with like a airbrush. A statue of them like destroying a building. That's the goal. 
bunch of kind of taking my time on them. I was going to say, if you do like a little, yeah, like a warm more and you run down. Pop those in. Yeah, the perspective of things would be really tough. Yeah. Like Gabriel's helmet is a bitch sometimes in the paint. Oh, really? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. There's like so many little pieces on it. Yeah, well now you got a statue. Well, I know, but even that, because like, I'm always redesigning the helmet. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like I took off the whole jaw part, so it's just glass. In it. Oh, okay. Pupils. I always realize that maybe like the eye shape is a little wrong for that pose. So you know, like pull it up. Oh, the little light. That's why I say it always looks weird in CG. When they have CG faces, they never put that in the eyes, so they yeah. look dull. It looks kind of strange when yeah, they don't so it's do like, that. Yeah, because that's the light from like you know lighting around you. Yeah, exactly. So it's like when you don't have that, but everyone else does, it looks weird. Right, let's try to make and I feel this like it just adds a light, too. Try to make that eye the same. Can you duplicate it? I could. You could try it. I'll do the old duplicate trick. <laughs> Whenever I don't want to paint something again, like, I'll just do like it. I'll just move this bad boy over. Yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, no, I'm just excited for the course. Hope that everybody can, can join or can stop by or check it out afterwards. It'd be cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if this is just a little taste. Yeah. I'm really excited to have you on this. Thanks. Sure. Gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.